What is going on? How are you, Aziz? What's up? It's good to be here. Dude, thank you so much for coming to hang out with me today. I'm excited to have you here. I'm very excited to be here. I feel like I'm in this special club that gets to be uh, a part of this pod. So yeah, we're, it's an honor. We're just getting rolling, but it's it's uh, we're having a lot of fun for sure. I'm losing count. This is my sixth episode, so we're starting to get some traction. It's, it's been fun putting this together. Let's kind of dive in here. So today I'm here with Aziz Akut. You're an apartment broker with Marcus and Millichap. Thanks again for coming to hang out with me today. Um, I'm excited to be chatting with you. I think we've known each other maybe about a year. About a year. Yeah. 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 Kind of met with the families and the kids and yeah, all just that. Just forced upon one another because yeah. of kids' sports. That's, hey, that's <laughs> what, and then good people yeah. you know, connect with like minds. Like minds. Exactly. <laughs> sure. So, but no, thank you. So, yeah, if you don't mind, can you kind of just give us a little bit of a background on PR and, you know, how you got into what you do and, and just yeah. go from there? Yeah, well, you know, prior to becoming an apartment broker, I didn't really have much of an experience. I've been doing this for about 10 years. Okay. I started early on when I was newly married and my wife and I were expecting our first child. And I had just come out of like a marketing gig with like a startup company. And I thought like we were going to get bought out and I was going to like ride this entrepreneurial wave with them. It just didn't pan out the way I thought it would. And again, sure. I had a kid on the way and my wife's like, so what's the plan? <laughs> what are we going to do? <laughs> right. And so I just decided to go for it. I had the blessing to be able to use up a little bit of my runway and, and just like fully commit to the commercial real estate world, which I always wanted to get into real estate. I just didn't know if I wanted to be in residential or commercial. Okay. And so I interviewed around as like an assistant slash agent with a couple of top producers and one gentleman in particular, I wonder if I should say his name. He's no longer with us. Uh, Barry, you'll know who he is. Really, really good guy. Barry Tashikori. And I'll just say his I name. Know Barry. Yeah. Rest in peace, Barry. He actually hired me. And he figured out that I had another interview lined up, with Marcus and Millichap, which okay. his brother worked at. Okay. And so he's like, you know what? Go interview with them and then get back to me. That's my brother. So oh, go wow. talk to them. And so I did. And I ended up staying at Marcus and Millichap. I just really liked the atmosphere. It was very sure. like objective reasoning on values. And like there wasn't as much emotion, which kind of gave me some anxiety of dealing with, with people's emotions. Right. And so, you know, it's been an amazing ride so far. And uh, things are, I feel like I'm just getting started. And I've got three kids now. Yep. And we live here in La Costa. And it's just giving me such an amazing life. Life, Beautiful family, yeah, that's for sure. To help people like improve their position and then also, you know, help myself improve my position as well. So right on. yeah, it's been, it's been a good ride. All right. Well, that's a, a quick, good, good overview. You know, let's, let's dive in a little bit here onto, you know, generating business. So, you, you know, obviously you're a commercial broker. There's a myriad of ways that you can generate business in, in the space, but you know, what's like some of the key components to how you generate your business? Yeah. So it's not rocket science. What I do doesn't take a lot of technical skill. It's more like interpersonal. So we really focus on at our firm on proactive marketing, reaching out to people directly. Uh, and so my like subset of investors that I, I target are like mom and pop, you know, like one to $10 million. Okay. And what we do is we cold call. That's like the, the best form of business generation. So Sounds. yeah, right out of the gate, they teach us, you know, you go in, you cold call, you put in your calls, you develop your list, your target lists. And the people that are the most proficient in overcoming like the objections uh, early on, as you can imagine, you, we, we all get cold called. We, of course. I hang up on people all the time, as do you. Right. The ones that can overcome that tend to be the most successful. So the more you call, the luckier you get. Okay. And I think, you know, my fiercest competitors in the marketplace right now, they all cold call. Oh, really? Yeah. Tremendous, tremendous abilities on the cold, on the phones. Once you get in front of the people, you, you figure out what their, you know, problems are, what their goals are, and you try to figure out ways to help add value to that. And that's like kind of the second part of that continuum, but just yeah. cold calling, that's like the, the main way we generate business. Okay. And uh, once we sit down with people, we figure out if it's warranted for us to, you know, uh, do an analysis for their properties. And once we figure out if there is a motivation for them to sell at some point down the line, whether it's immediate or, you know, six months, years down the line, then we're there. We're, we've Got developed the relationship. We've developed the relationship. Yeah. That's kind of the biggest thing is building relationships. Well, so lenders, right? We, we, there's a gazillion lenders out there. There's a gazillion real estate agents, residential agents. There's a bunch of commercial, yeah. probably have less on the commercial side than on the residential side, but you obviously got to differentiate, differentiate yourself. So providing, you know, value to your client, right? What is, what's like a, a sweet spot or where, where's the extra value that you and your team 
put forth to, you know, to, to, to separate yourself from the pack? There's two ways of doing the business. One is very transactional, just mm-hmm. focusing on the deal as a one off, on a one off basis. And that's definitely a way to like do really well. Um, and then another is actually like listening to the client and what their goals are, what their needs are. Mm-hmm. Sometimes it just doesn't make sense for someone to sell. And there's sure. a million reasons for that. So, you know, having that individual like truly feel like they're being heard as to what their goals are and then being able to deliver on that specific need that they have, whether it's research, financing, you know, sound analysis, that's not like pie in the sky analysis. That's like wishful thinking. Right. That's really the best way. It's a little hard early on because it takes such a long time to ramp up into getting business for a new agent to do that, to deliver that, because they're really focused on trying to get those fees early on to like sure. float them. That's really the, the best okay. way to separate yourself. Well, and then there's, let's get into like, like the nitty gritties of it. So like, you know, when you're, when you're looking at deals, like there's, you know, there's, you guys perform equity analysis and you got to underwrite, you know, the deals. Like, let's talk a little bit further about yeah. you know, that, that piece of it. Yeah. So You know, the way you would analyze like a single family home when you do like a, what is it called? The CMA, Mm -hmm. an analysis for that value is like you pull comps and you eliminate the outliers and you kind of show like general value based off of, you know, price per per square foot and like bedroom bathroom count, a few other metrics. But for commercial properties or I sell apartment buildings, anything over five, uh, five units and up is considered commercial. So it qualifies for a commercial loan. Those deals are underwritten completely differently. Debt that you get on those properties is predicated on how much income does that property produce north of what the the cost of the debt is at the time. And so we do a full analysis that basically uh, touches on different metrics, cap rate analysis, GRM, which is a gross rent multiple. We, We can get into that later. Price per unit and price per square foot. Okay. And so all different ways to study the property. Exactly. So basically a lender is going to lend to you on a commercial property and then they're going to make sure that the property is able to support itself. And a good rule of thumb is if the net income, which is gross income minus operating expenses, that's the net income that needs to generally exceed the current cost of the debt, the annual debt by like 20%. Okay. That's a good rule of thumb. Is it too complicated, you think, to put like some general numbers, like you know, like for an example, like you have a, a property you could kind of just walk us through or is that too complicated? Yeah, yeah, that's that's talk, fine. Talk so whatever? if a property makes $100,000 a year, okay. you subtract from that, let's call it 35% of operating expenses. It's probably more. Let's call it 40%. Okay. So you shave off $40,000 a year in expenses. Right. You're left with $60,000 a year, mm-hmm. right? So I suck at math. I use my calculator. <laughs> <That's> all right. <laughs> so you take your sixty thousand dollars a year, and you know your debt needs to be around forty eight thousand dollars a year okay. for it to qualify. So right, we understand what's happening in the marketplace. Sure. Interest rates are going up. Yep. And a lot of people are freaking out. And you know, generally speaking, the higher the cost of debt, you know, the the more income the property needs to produce to support sure. that loan at that particular value. But the problem is. You know, multifamily, at least in California, I think the United States as a whole is probably regarded as the safest asset class in commercial real estate. And so values continue to go up regardless of the fact that interest rates are going up. It's the value, whereas like in the residential side, yeah. it's gone up so fast yeah. that now you're starting to see a leveling off. And even, you know, people are starting to get negotiate back and forth on purchases on residential. That's not necessarily happening in the commercial side. No, because the banks for residential are underwriting the borrower as opposed to, you know, commercial. They're really under the Let's talk about that. Building. Banks and, and the way they underwrite the deal is totally different than residential. And we touched on it for a second. But let's go a little deeper. Into that. Yeah. So banks are going to look at a myriad of information coming from the property. Rent roll, operating statements, you know, insurance loss runs to figure out if there's any claims. And they want to really understand like what this property is, what it's producing, what the projected rents are, which is very subjective. But they'll, sure. they'll look at like actual comps in the marketplace. Okay. And they'll also look at like the credit credibility and the ability, I should say the ability of the buyer to to be able to stabilize these assets and move them. And so they want to, they have these underwriting thresholds that they need to meet. Like for example, if a property has lean expenses, it's probably because the owner at the time is, is just not investing as much money as they should be. And so the bank is looking to protect its shareholders. And so they're going to stress test these buildings and uh, have, you know, certain uh, thresholds for each line item. Okay. Utilities, 
insurance, you know, property tax has to be reassessed at the sale sale value. That's a no-brainer. They'll even put in like a reserves line item for okay. like on a per unit basis annually. Okay. And so they'll stress test the numbers and they'll come up with their own net operating income, which may be different from how the property is actually performing. Okay. And so they'll they'll stress test the building and they'll make sure that net income also exceeds their debt quote by a certain amount. And so where the borrower comes into play is they have to have, you know, good credibility, good credit, and they have to have at least been able to demonstrate that they're competent to manage these assets. I'm talking a lot more about stable, uh, unstabilized products, value add deals. For the most part, a lot of the deals that are transacting today, there's a lot of value to be added. You know, a lot of times the people that we're selling properties for are long-term owners uh, that maybe have inherited properties that are, you know, does uh, dissolving partnerships or marriages okay. and so you know for some one reason or another they're selling for a reason and, and they have you know these these properties that just haven't really been taken care of as well and so it's incumbent on the buyer to come in and demonstrate to the bank to clean them up exactly and so what's what's unique right now is a lot of these properties the, the rate of return is less than the interest rate that's being offered for an example properties are being sold at a three percent capitalization rate and interest rates are right now in the high fives low sixes for multifamily products which is by the way unlike the interest rates that you'll find for different asset classes retail industrial office those banks those committees they get together and they decide what those rates are going to be for those different asset classes okay yeah and so i'm losing my train of thought but uh i think i think the most important thing to note is that you have to really demonstrate to a bank that you're competent and credit worthy okay yeah. cool let's talk about research like you have to do your research right in the in the marketplace and identifying where opportunities are maybe bringing opportunities to your investment base how do you guys do that what's your way that you go out and study the marketplace and, and find search and yeah. So like I said early on uh, with, with the new people coming into the business, it's, it's really cold calling, Okay. but it's not just cold calling. Like you really have to stay up with people and their storylines. Everyone has like different things going on in their life. Sure. So staying consistent and, and, and staying on the phone with them, you know, over a course of years really, Got really it. matters. Inserting yourself when the time presents itself. And so over the course of like me knowing you, for example, and let's just say you own an apartment building. Yep. I'm going to meet you for the first time if I can close the, on the first call mm -hmm. and we're going to sit down and I'm going to really pitch to do like an analysis for you, an okay. equity analysis for the building. I'm going to show you what we think the building's worth based off of the metrics that we discussed. Okay. And then we're going to talk about how much equity you have in your property, what your return on equity is. And we're going to show you, you know, if you were to refinance right now, what, what that would look like. If uh, you were to sell the property, what that would look like, what the consequences are of selling a property outright, you know, how to do a 1031 exchange yeah. where you defer your taxes into other properties. A lot of people have like different goals. They want to, they want to increase, you know, their unit scale. They want to have more units or they want to downsize into, you know, smaller properties. And so we're going to do that analysis for you. And then we're going to update it for you once every six months give or take. And we're going to stay up on it with you on, uh, you know, market research and what's happening in the marketplace and just like really building, building you know, long-term relationships, long-term like relationship. sales cycles, like, you know, years in some cases, it, or, many times. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the, the, the biggest red flag for me is like when I speak with someone for the first or second time on the phone, they say, yeah, I'm so I want to sell. Really? When someone says that you're, you're probably late to yeah. the, to the, late party. to the party. Yeah. And you're probably like the third or fourth guy he's told that to, and he's just like trying to shop offers off market. And, and, you know, guys like us will certainly like try to pursue that business, sure. but you know, we're, 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 we can't do everything perfectly. You know, it's, it's not uh, always as ideal as you want it to be in an ideal world. You know, you take the property out, you list it, you put it out in the open market, you develop offers, but not everyone's sold on that idea for one reason or another. And you just have to uh, decide if you're going to invest that time with that individual by bringing them offers off market with like absolutely no control. So manage, uh, managing time is also like a very critical factor. You can go down a rabbit hole and, and waste a lot of time. If exactly. You're not yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Touch on 1031 exchange. Let's explore that a little further because that's a really hot topic. I feel like people are interested in understanding, you know, going from one property to the next, the, the tax yeah. tax benefits of doing that. Let's go into that one on the commercial side. Yeah. So, I mean, when you sell real estate investment properties, you're going to pay tax, a lot of tax. Of and it's really based off of what you bought it for and then what you end up selling for. So what that profit is, is subject to uh, state and federal 
capital gains capital tax. Gains, yep. And that bracket that you fall under is is kind of dick predicated on like how much income you make and how much money is coming out. And so for the most part, people are facing massive capital gains consequences and they don't want to pay you know, that tax. And so the IRS has given us this vehicle to be able to defer that consequence by by moving that gain to a different property. And so you need to, uh, the, 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 the main rule is, is that you, if you sell a property for a certain amount, say a million dollars, the next property that you purchase has to be for equal to that value or greater. Some more in kind. In like kind like property. Exactly. So, you know, fee simple property that exactly. So can't be land. Although there are special rules like with that, that I won't get into. I'm, I'm not a financial advisor or I'm not a 1031 intermediary. So sure. we, we can kind of get into that. I can, we can forward some leads as well to your viewers to learn more about that. But okay. That's really the gist of it. So uh, when you do a 1031 exchange, there's certain timeline rules as well that you have to yeah, abide by. Yeah, there's definitely concerns people have. Let's talk about yeah. that because, yeah, there's timelines and other pitfalls. Yeah, so everyone knows about 1031 exchanges for the most part. So the, the biggest concern that we deal with as agents is when someone says, okay, Aziz, you're going to sell my property and we're going to 1031 exchange. Awesome. This is great. Well, you know, I ha how do I know that I'm going to be able to find a property? Because, you know, the rules are you're going to have 45 days to figure out what you're going to buy. You're going to have to let the IRS know about that. And then 40 uh, and six months, which runs concurrently from the close of escrow on, on the down leg, the property that you're selling okay. to close on that property. Six months. Six months. Exactly. So the big concern is like, what do I find? I'm going to be, you know, I've got all this cash now in, in this like 1031 account and I'm out here trying to find properties and there's like not enough property product out there. And so that's, that's big. So the, the most important thing is, you know, teaming up with the right person that's at least able to cold call proactively on your behalf and having, before you even do that, uh, having the understanding as to what it's going to take for you to get into the next property. If you've got all this cash coming out of this property, that's awesome. But you know, if, if the properties that you're now shopping for cost a lot more money, right? You're, you're probably going to have to either take the hit or or borrow money mm -hmm. to do that mm -hmm. and and if you're going to borrow money do you understand what those terms are with that with that lender so what i really stress on when someone does an exchange or wants to do an exchange before we even analyze the property i really push for hey let's get you with a lender sure and let's figure out you know we want to make sure you know what it's going to take for you to 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 borrow money on something whatever that may be so i'll put together several scenarios of different properties that that person can purchase mm -hmm. we'll take this uh, uh theoretical uh, uh cash out that they're getting mm -hmm. and we're, we're gonna run uh loan scenarios for them okay uh based off of the current rates that are available and we'll just try to manage that expectation. You know, how much is it going to cost for you to get an appraisal? How much is it going to cost for you to pay the bank, to pay the originator on, the, on that note? And uh, gosh, I've seen scenarios where people sell their properties and they come to realize that they're unable to qualify for the loan. Ouch. Scary. Yeah. And so, you know, that brings in, you know, private money scenarios and, and extra fees yeah, and higher rates. Mismanaged expectations and, you know, people get really stuck. Um, and, and for that to happen, especially over the last, you know, five years for someone to like, you know, eat it in a market economy where, you know, everything's on an upswing, it's no bueno. It's not good. So yeah, uh, focusing on qualifying for the loan is like the biggest, biggest thing. And, and just, I want to add one yeah, thing, uh, the, the loans, uh, to do these loans, it typically takes for commercial, uh, at least 45 days. Unlike residential, it takes like. Yeah. We say 30, but we can do it in 15 or less if someone's like on it. Exactly. Yeah. But, you know, the 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 information, right, they're, they're managing the performance of the asset, these sure. banks. So the information comes in, the appraisal comes in, the appraisal can take two weeks sure. to come back, right? So uh, they take all that information, the underwriter puts it all together and asks questions. And that process is at least 30 days for that individual. And then once he has the file ready to present to their loan committee, that that's another week and a half, two weeks, assuming everything moves fast. Now, in a market where uh, some banks are offering the best rates, those banks are slammed, right? Mm -hmm. Everyone, they're getting all the business for one reason or another. So those timelines could be even expanded to from 45 to 60, 60 days. Yeah, 60 days plus. That's why commercial deals take so long is like the underwriting process. Um, and that's just multifamily for, you know, office or industrial sites. Certain banks want 
environmental analysis. Okay. Those reports take many weeks to, to produce. Mm -hmm. Phase one studies, phase two studies, that, that can take even longer. And that's like thousands and thousands of it's dollars. a lot of money to yeah. pass data so, together. As, a, as a, a buyer that would not know that going into it, I mean, you can imagine how upset that person is going to be. I mean, you really put yourself in great jeopardy. So don't be misled sometimes. I think a big pitfall, this is just my PSA, <laughs> when you get off-market offers, uh, it, it sounds great. It could sound like a really great pie-in-the-sky idea. Just please, please understand your, your capital gains consequences mm -hmm. and, and what's going to be expected of you if, you're, if you are, in fact, planning on deferring those gains. Let's go back to like focus on, you know, being successful in your field. So there's, you know, always like the best of the best, the guys that just crush, the dominate yeah. the space, the middle of the road guys. And then the rookies just time to start get figuring it out. Yeah. You know, what does it take to really climb the ladder and be like, you know, the best of the best in commercial real estate as a broker? Great question. I think the most, if, if I could describe it in one word is just consistency, consistently persistent. So prospecting, cold calling, prospecting, cold calling, and just relationships. Like, yeah. That's like inherent. Like everyone that's somewhat personable can like build a decent enough relationship, but being sure. able to like stay up and having a system internally on how to stay up on uh, certain individuals, having a process of like a, having a reminder to like update you know, an assessment that you've done six, four, five, six months ago, or uh, staying up to date on research and just being able to consistently provide that value and put your name out there. I think that's the most important thing. So what I see the most successful guys in the business, they typically have like a support team, kind of like what you have. And they have an assistant, they have someone that's, they're able to delegate certain functions to certain individuals that just focus on that one particular task, leaving the pure prospecting for the, the money maker, the, the main guy. The main guy. Yep. Yeah. I mean, if, if you could just have that, I mean, you're, you're golden because all you have to do is just focus on one function, prospecting Absolutely. and getting getting in front of people. Now, newer agents, are they that are just getting ramped up like early on in your career and yep. like you getting started? You know, what were the focus points there? Was it the prospecting? You don't maybe have the team yet, right? You don't have the team. I mean, generally when you come in, at least like with multifamily and commercial real estate, I mean, the, the way our industry is is uh, is built is uh, there, there's mentorship, right? Okay. You go in, you have a senior agent that kind of takes you under their wing. You put in the work, you cold call, you sure. get in front of people, you get your partner in front of people, and they help you reel in that business. I like Boiler Room, the movie Boiler Room. Exactly. <laughs> ABC. Yeah. It's exactly. Let go. Yeah. So, so uh, again, I mean, going in, you're probably, unless your team, your senior has like a, a really good um uh, assistant that's able to produce like proposals and help you on that like back end support. Mm -hmm. A lot of it's going to fall on your shoulders. So you're going to be working like 80 hours a week, no oh, joke, wow. going in on Saturdays. I mean, I, I, when I, when I started, I remember uh, the day my kid was born, I, I was in the office like that same day, wow. which in hindsight, you know, I regret now sure. that I've got my kids. Right. Uh, but uh, that's kind of what it took. For me, I was, my wife was literally like, what are you doing here? Like my mom's here. Get, get out of here. Wow. Go. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Which I, I'm very thankful. I mean, having, sure. having that support at home is like so crucial. Sure. So crucial. I mean, without the, the home support, my wife, family, I mean, that it just doesn't work. You need right. to have someone help, helping you emotionally, mentally yeah, to do that. To give you the lift you need. To give you the lift. Exactly. So uh, to answer your question for the young guys coming up, I think the most important thing is having an understanding of the runway of time that it's mm -hmm. going to take for you to close a deal. Mm -hmm. Many shops will tell you it'll be like six months. Sure. It's not realistic. You, you really should give yourself a year. a year. You could get lucky and yeah. get in front of the right person at the right time. And you sure. just got this like unicorn buyer or seller that happens, but give yourself a good year to year and a half okay. of making no income whatsoever, ah. preparing yourself. Maybe you're working a side job some way yeah. and putting Lighting. Putting in that, putting in those hours, and expecting to to kind of do all that back end support. It makes the barrier to entry a little bit tougher. You got to figure you're going a year, a year and a half without income. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you almost need that side hustle or different. You know, like you said, it's it's crazy, and uh, it's it's just not for everyone. But you know, in a sense, I you know, I'm kind of proud that there is a high barrier to entry. And yeah. I, and I think it's to the benefit of the 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 buyer and seller pool that we sure. have you know, certain individuals that have managed to last for as long as they have been. Um, it, it just kind of, if, if someone's been doing it for a while and, and we're cold calling you, like you, you should probably like listen to what we have to say. Sure. You know what you're doing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And and if it's not me, even my competitors, like, you know, we, we kind of fight for listings and, and business all the time, but I have tremendous respect for mm -hmm. 
everyone that is in our industry because i we all understand like what we e we each have to do to make it so whether it's me or someone else at a different shop like if we're cold calling you take a moment to hear what we have to say and you know let's build you know a relationship Ooh, and and i think something good will come out of that for both sides love it yeah so let's shift for a minute let's talk about you know finding good deals everyone wants a good deal in anything right but in, in specifically commercial real estate apartments where does someone find a good deal what is a good deal? <laughs> let's start there. It's what so is a subjective. Good deal? Yeah, let's start right there. I mean, everyone's got a different goal, whether it's like sure. hedging on whatever bets they made in the market or, yeah. you know, they need to you know park cash for to help care for someone. The most important thing, just as we agents are building relationships, trying to build relationships with investors, with owners, it's incumbent on the investor, the owner of the building as well to build relationships with the agents. To, to reach out. So if you're looking to buy a deal, you know, make yourself known, reach out to the agents whose names you see everywhere and okay. introduce yourself, let them know what the goals are and mm -hmm. keep a friendly report. Cause sure. when that person finds a great deal or a deal, that's probably going to get a lot of interest. Mm -hmm. They're probably going to go to the people that have shown them the most that have reciprocated sure. that respect and the most successful investors that are crushing it right now, that get all the deals, have the best relationships with the brokerage community. And I'm talking about like, they know like, you know, your, their wife's name, you know, the family members, kids, you know, it's They're deep. It's more personal. Yeah. yeah, right? Cause everyone wants to work with someone they enjoy working with. Sure. And, and I think there's a misconception that, you know, this is a thankless business. And in certain cases it can be, and it, people tend to be transactional, but I think the ones that have done really well have just reached out to agents and have, have had that like mutual relationship. Okay. And so that's, I think that's, that's really critical. Um, professional investors, right? Um, they, they, everyone wants to, you know, continuously be active, looking at deals, looking at, at opportunities, you know, what are, um, you know, professional investors, what do they do to stay active and to constantly be other that you just had to hit on it where they're constantly in front of their brokers like yourself and communicating. I mean, is there, so, so they take it one step further, right? So they're not just meeting brokers and, and putting, you know, smiles on faces, you know, they're out writing offers on deals, okay. even deals that they might not even like. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Um, they're, they're out driving the market. They understand the markets intimately just as much, mm -hmm. if not maybe more than the brokerage community does. Okay. They have good banking relationships. Sure. They understand the needs of different lenders in the marketplace okay. and, and what is expected of them mm -hmm. for those loans. So, um, you know, understanding, you know, reach out to your real estate agent and ask them, Hey, who are the, who are the top three, four lenders in the marketplace? I want to get to, I want to get to know what I want to know what the criteria is to qualify for a loan. Sure. For that individual. What what are their rates? Mm -hmm. Where are the penalties for for you know paying off loans and uh, kind of getting into the just nitty just getting the nitty gritties and learning all those details. Nitty gritty, exactly. And so uh I, I talked about like writing on offers, like when an agent uh sends someone a deal, you know, so a lot of times the person's busy and if they don't like it, they just don't respond sure at all and that's cool that's fine but i think the people that reciprocate communicate mm -hmm. consistently with that agent that that's typically the person that ends up getting more looks at different properties okay because there's that feedback nice. and i talked about writing offers on deals they might not even like i mean you don't you don't know sometimes sure. certain a lot of buyers they have they look end up looking at a deal two three four times mm -hmm. before they actually pull the trigger and then hindsight they're like wow this was a great deal. Well, yeah, <laughs> I should have sure, written on sure. this sooner. Yeah. Yeah. But the, people are processing so much information. It's understandable. Mm -hmm. But sometimes if, if an agent, like you feel like you can trust that individual, like mm -hmm. listen to what they have to say, mm -hmm. have them pitch you on okay. why they think it's a good deal. Okay. As opposed to just writing a deal off completely. Gotcha. Okay. But it's, it's a two way road. It's a two way. Right. You know, a lot of agents, very cliche. Like we fit, we fit into this like stereotype that we're like, I don't know, uh, salesman of like low, low class, low end salesman, right. right. Where we're just pushing any product and every product, regardless of whether it's good or bad. And it's just, it's always sounds like the best property. Right. right. And so I think it's also incumbent on us agents is to, you know, if we're going to like, um, uh, endorse something is we have to do it earnestly, not, sure. not just like any, any property. Yeah, it's not just feeding everything. Yeah. It's you gotta, you wanna, okay. Yeah. That makes sense. Nice. So it's, it, 
mutual relationship. So let's have some fun for a minute. So let's talk about some, maybe some crazy stories, you know, being a commercial agent here in San Diego, like you've got to have some stories or, you know, oh some stuff happening Anything off the top of your head that you want to share. Of my gosh. <laughs> I mean, generally speaking, I think you don't really know what you're going to get into when you walk into a property for an inspection. Right. And so sometimes you go in for the first time and the owner even hasn't been in the property for you know years, right? right. They could be sure. an out of town owner. And so I remember one time we went in a unit and, and we were looking at the operating statement. We realized, hey, you know, certain utilities are really, really high. Went into all the units, everything was good. And then the last unit that we went into was marijuana growing operation. Oh, no way. <laughs> yeah. Oh. And this was earlier on in my career and it wasn't as friendly of an environment for the cannabis industry as it is today. But okay. that, that was kind of a scary moment for me for yeah. sure the whole and facility just racks and racks of yeah it was just like and... literally the living room the bedroom i mean they had like the fluorescent lighting it was just un unreal wow. like it was actually very like impressive like wow this, this yeah. is a very entrepreneurial person and i think there was a show once on hbo where okay. they i think that was the premise like they would okay. grow in houses and oh interesting yeah yeah okay. weeds i think it was called i forget okay okay i didn't see so, it. so that was one um other crazy stories are like look very competitive mindset to be uh, an agent in general and so showing up to to meetings and uh having you know seeing your competitor mm -hmm. kind of lurking in the background waiting for their turn to, mm -hmm. to like intervene with that individual right. so it gets very cutthroat for sure okay um i <laughs> i'm trying to think what else oh uh, that was, was just curious that's not those that's a that's a great story i mean yeah. the, the cannabis one's pretty fun yeah um Let's, I mean, we kind of kind of wrap up here, but what are some action items? You know, someone, you know, they, they, they're brand new. They want to get going into investing in the commercial space. They want to buy multifamily. What would be your advice to them? They came to you and said, Hey, what's step one? You know, obviously kind of give us some, some framework or roadmap to what that would look like for yeah. a newer investor. Yeah. I mean, you may not think you have enough cash to make something work. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the most important thing, and I touched on this earlier is taught getting with a lender. Okay. figuring out what is expected of you reach out to your friends and family figure out like in your network or, you know are you putting the money together to get you know all together uh and and what is expected of you what is expected of you if you decided to pay off that note in the, in the first few years some people have this idea that they're going to buy a property and they're going to flip it right, right? we see that a lot with home flippers right but you know with commercial properties a lot of times there's penalties for selling these properties like you know up to five six percent in certain cases, yeah. way more, depending on like the, the specific loan product, yield maintenance. We I won't get into that, but um, understanding what is expected to you, of you when you go and borrow the money, and uh, figuring out how much money you need. Now, for commercial properties, unlike residential, you need to you typically put a lot of money down. It's typically sure. like 35, 40 percent down of, of the full value, and that's that's a lot. Sometimes it if there's a chunk of change, yeah, if there's enough money, uh, if there's enough value to be added to the property and the bank sees that like for example the rents are really 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 below market and if it was fully stabilized the value is going to be that much more then a bank could lend on based off of that future value Generally. but you'll still need 30 percent of the current ask price or purchase price to do the deal and that's going to be a short-term loan as well right so understanding like if you're going to do those value those fixers and you're going to do that kind of loan you're going to need to know like hey you're going to have to hustle you're going to have to have your contractors lined up you're going to have to have a good budget and, and understanding of what the cost is to renovate a unit you know right now values are all going up for all all different you know materials you right. know, windows everything cabinets paint all that stuff so having a a, a very uh, strong awareness of what that cost is going to be is going to be really, really important. Making sure, especially right now where everything seems like it's crashing, uh, not getting caught on something and, and being the, that guy that pays like the astronomical price beyond what everyone else is paying. Don't want to be that guy. Don't want to be that guy. Be no, that guy. no. What is your, you know, I don't want to say crystal ball, but like, you know, residential real estate, you know, it's, it's stabilizing and it's, yeah. you know, it's on this crazy rocket ship to the moon. Like it's been about values yeah. and the commercial side, you know, what does the next call it 12, 18, 24 months, you know, look like from your perspective in the commercial commercial segment? Well, I mean, in the commercial segment, there's different product types. I'm personally very optimistic about multifamily. 
just because it's always been kind of seen as the safest asset class. Unfortunately, there's a housing crisis right now and there's not enough product, new product coming online to satisfy all these renters in the marketplace. So I think all apartments right now, and I just focus in San Diego, right? Sure. So I see tremendous demand still, regardless of the fact that interest rates are going up. But, you know, I believe that we have the strongest country in the world. And I think across the United States, all asset classes are, are going to do well. You know, if you focus on like a dollar cost average approach of just buying a relatively good deal in any market, you're going to you're going to do OK long term. Sure. But if it's like your one off deal and you're going to do one deal every five years, you know, just be very mindful of, you know, what the downside is being very aware of that. Sure. But overall, I'm, I'm extremely optimistic over the next 18 months. I, I personally think that rates will come back. Uh, I agree with you. Yeah. And I suppose that's why they're you know, bringing rates up so fast, so aggressively to be able to bring them back down. So I suppose at some point, I don't know, but I think you have a good insight on that. Yeah, there's a lot of factors. We don't want to get into all that today, but yeah. yeah, there's a lot of reasons that they've been hiked up as fast as they have. It's Yeah, but that's just me. That's my yeah. Aziz crystal ball. Okay. It might not be the, 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 the clearest crystal ball, but uh, I, I'm just very bullish on on the product. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, dude, it's been fun hanging out with you today. I really yeah, enjoyed uh, fun. chatting with you, man. Yeah, this is awesome. So, I appreciate um, it. Thanks for your time. Yep, thanks. All right, brother. We'll see you later. See you, buddy. Boom.